Okay, we are live on YouTube. So welcome everyone. We're very happy, happy to have Paul, uh, Abdu, and Nicholas present today. And so let me just mute that before we get Paul's feedback. So welcome everyone. We're very happy. Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Nicholas, take it away. And uh, remember, everyone, uh, if you have questions, please ask them in the, the Q&A. Uh, we have Pavel and Abdu here to answer your questions. Uh, more substantive questions we'll answer in the, the live Q&A afterwards. So, Nicholas, take it away. Thanks. Well, thanks so much, Kurt, and thanks, everyone, for being here. Thanks, everyone, for um, inviting me to present at BMAX. It's a pleasure. Uh, it's a paper uh, joint with Pavel and Abdu, who are here in the in the room, uh, called Redistribution with Performance Pay. So in this paper, we carry out a positive and normative analysis of labor income tax policy in a setting where workers' wages are a function of their performance at work. So the motivation for studying this problem is twofold. First, empirically, there is a very large fraction of all the jobs, about 50% in the US, that explicitly feature performance pay. Um, you know, by performance pay, we mean, we mean anything from piece rates to commissions to bonuses, stock options, uh, et cetera. So these jobs are particularly common at the top of the income distribution. So think of bankers, CEOs, and the like but they're also common throughout the wage distribution from fruit pickers to real estate brokers to retail salespeople, and so on and so forth. So the first question we wanna address is given the prevalence of, these, uh, of this type of labor contracts, we wanna understand how they are affected by tax policy. Um, and by that, what we mean is we want to understand the impact of say tax progressivity on both the level of, of earnings and their sensitivity to performance or the amount of risk involved in these contracts. So it's a purely positive tax incidence analysis of the impact of taxes on, on these labor contracts. Uh, the second motivation for this project is that um, most standard models of taxation in the tradition of Merlis typically assume that wage rates are exogenous equal to the workers' you know, fixed uh, labor productivity. So a common concern that's been raised in the literature uh, with these models is that they substantially overestimate the benefits of raising tax progressivity. Why? Because they ignore the fact that in response to improved social insurance, the private insurance within the firm is gonna be crowded out uh, via endogenous wages. And so in this paper, we want to take this concern seriously and we ask how are the optimal uh, redistributive tax policies affected by the fact that, um, you know, wage contracts are endogenous. So we set up a model to, to answer these two questions. Uh, the model uh, has the following structure. So workers are going to be heterogeneous along two dimensions. First, they are going to differ in ex ante ability. So think about um, their raw talent or their education. And second, they are gonna be heterogeneous in exposed on the job um, output shocks performance. And the key difference between these two dimensions of heterogeneity is that uh, firms can ensure on the job performance shocks, but they cannot ensure ex ante ability. So firms will design a contract that optimally trades off on the one hand, the need to provide insurance for the worker against performance shocks versus on the other hand, the need to provide uh, them with incentives to, to exert effort. And this, this, this model, which naturally will generate uh, performance-based contracts is based uh, on Edmonds and Gabex in the static setting and Edmonds, Gabex, Sadzik and Sanikov in the dynamic settings. We'll see why we use this particular foundation for uh, the wage contracts between the firm and the worker. Then the government uh, uses nonlinear taxes, can be arbitrary nonlinear tax instruments. And the goal of the government is to redistribute between, to redistribute income between workers of different uh, ex ante abilities. Remember, ex ante ability is not insurable within the firm. 
so the government cannot ensure or cannot do better than firms at ensuring uh, on the job output shocks, but its goal is to uh, redistribute over uh, ex ante abilities. So in this setting, we derive closed form expressions for the impact, <coughs> sorry, for the impact of nonlinear tax reforms on first labor contracts, so individual earnings uh, and individual utilities. So that's the pure tax incidence analysis of who bears the burden of a given tax reform. And second, the impact, what is the impact of tax reform on aggregate government revenue and social welfare? And that leads to our normative analysis of what's the optimal uh, tax policy, the optimal rate of progressivity in this uh, environment. Now, in this talk, uh, I'm going to focus on two very simple special cases of our general model. Um, and in particular, I'm going to make a bunch of functional form assumptions, which are going to uh, convey our main insights most transparently. In particular, I'm going to assume a restricted set of tax instruments, which we generalize in the paper. Okay, so the key findings of this paper is that broadly speaking, the prescriptions, the tax policy prescriptions arising in standard Merlisian models that ignore uh, endogenous wage risk, these prescriptions are actually robust to uh, introducing endogenous wages in the form of performance-based contracts. Um, so basically this concern that you know, tax progressivity should be much lower uh, because of the crowding out of private insurance, this concern is actually overblown. So uh, this is due to two different reasons. The first uh, is in our positive analysis. Now positive analysis, we show that um, if the government raises tax progressivity, this is hardly going to affect the sensitivity of earnings to performance. So, it's so tax progressivity is hardly going to affect the structure of compensation uh, between the firm and the worker. So why is that? Well, there is a crowd out effect. I talked about the crowding out effect earlier. There is a crowding out effect of private insurance via endogenous wages. So in response to higher progressivity, firms will make the pre-tax earnings schedule steeper. And we'll see why exactly uh, in a minute. But that crowding out is going to be actually almost fully offset by a countervailing effect, which we call the performance pay effect, which, which is going through uh, optimal labor supply uh, decisions. I'm going to explain very, uh, very precisely what I mean by these two effects in the, when I get to the model. But I just want to mention here one thing, which is that this, uh, the fact that these two effects exactly cancel out implies that there is very limited effect of tax progressivity on uh, performance-based contracts. And that actually seems to be consistent with the empirical evidence we found that uh, taxes hardly seem to affect um, earnings risk in performance pay contracts. So then the, the, the second part of analysis is the normative analysis. There we show that the optimal rate of progressivity in an economy with endogenous wages is indeed because of the crowd out, indeed strictly lower than with exogenous wage risk and in standard Malaysian economies. But the welfare loss from ignoring this endogeneity of wage risk and therefore from setting taxes suboptimally, the welfare loss is actually very small in magnitude. So, the, so, so that's a quantitative statement. The first statement about the incidence of taxes on the contract was a theoretical statement. Now, quantitatively, when we apply our optimal tax formula, uh, to a calibrated economy, we find that the welfare loss from setting taxes suboptimally is actually very small. So for these two reasons, positive and normative, we find that ignoring the endogeneity of wage risk is actually not uh, too big of a problem. Um, I'm going to skip for reasons of time the literature as is usual, uh, but I'm happy to get back to it in the discussion after. So what I'm going to do is I'm going uh, I'm going to first uh, look at an extremely simple version of our model. Um, and the goal is not going to be to be realistic or anything. It's just going to be to simply illustrate these two, you know, these two effects at play, the main mechanisms at play, which is one, the crowd out, and two, what I called uh, in the introduction, the performance pay effect that offsets it. Um, so I want to show what these uh, two forces are in the simplest possible way. And the simplest possible way is to consider a contract between the firm and the worker, a more hazard contract, uh, which is that of Holmstrom and Milgram, 1987. So you have a risk-averse worker 
and the risk neutral firm. And the, assume that the income tax schedule is affine. Okay, so constant tax rates uh, and lump sum rebates of the tax proceeds. We're going to make uh, one key assumption, which is the assumption of Holmstrom and Milgram, which is that the utility of the worker over consumption uh, and efforts uh, first has no income effects, and two is exponential. Uh, third, sorry, the this utility of effort we're going to assume is quadratic. Okay, so we're going to make these very strong functional form assumptions uh, uh, for the model to remain tractable. We're going to call throughout the talk the pre-tax earnings given by the firm to the workers W. The tax rate here, I'm assuming, is constant. We're going to call it tau, so that if the worker earns a pre-tax income W and pays a tax rate tau, her after-tax income, her consumption, is given by 1 minus tau times her wage plus T0, which is the lump sum rebate of tax revenue. Okay. Now, um, suppose that the worker provides a level of effort A. Uh, her output uh, on the job is going to be A plus eta. Eta is what we call the performance shock. And in this very simple version of the model, we're going to assume that the performance shock is normally distributed. The key is that the, there is a more hazard friction at play between the firm and the worker. The firm is going to observe the worker's output, meaning the sum of her efforts and her performance shock. But the firm is not going to be able to disentangle the two. Um, therefore, it's going, to provide, it's going to design a contract that's optimally going to balance the need to provide insurance against this performance shock eta, but still is going to try to provide incentives uh, for effort. So the contract is going to specify a recommended level of effort A and an earning schedule, a pre-tax earning schedule W. Okay, And W, the pre-tax earnings, are allowed to depend on uh, output, on the realized output of the worker. So this contract, how is it uh, constructed? I, I don't write equations here, but basically the firm maximizes uh, its expected profit, subject to an incentive constraint, so subject to the fact that the worker is indeed going to uh, work the recommended level of effort and participation constraints. The firm has to deliver the worker um, her, reservation, her reservation utility, which is determined in equilibrium by free entry on labor markets. Okay, And uh, so we are in a setting where we can apply the results of Holmstrom and Milgram, where the optimal contract, the optimal earning schedule, is going to be linear in, or affine, really, in output. Okay, so it's going to be a linear contract. And the key parameter for us is going to be the sensitivity psi of earnings to output. So if the worker uh, is more productive, uh, is higher performer, her earnings are going to be higher. And what's going to uh, determine the relationship between those two is that parameter psi, the sensitivity. Okay. So we can actually compute, we can actually derive the exact form of this contract because the model is so simple we obtain the following equation. So that sensitivity of earnings to output, psi, is going to be an increasing function of effort. OK, and that is key. That is going to be key for us. And it's completely um, sort of standard, more hazard insight, where eliciting a higher level of effort, if the firm wants to elicit a higher level of effort, it's going to have to increase the risk exposure uh, of the worker. So it's going to have to increase the sensitivity of the worker's compensation uh, to her performance. Okay, so the sensitivity of, uh, of, uh, of wages is increasing in effort A. Now we can ask, you know, what is the, what is the, how does the contract change when we vary taxes? So how does the sensitivity parameter psi depend on the tax rate too? Um, so here, from this equation, we see that there is immediately uh, one direct effect, uh, which is that the sensitivity psi is increasing, is directly increasing in the parameter two. Okay, and so that's what we call the crowd out. It's saying that if the government tries to increase the tax rate and hence the rebate, so increase the overall progressivity of the tax system, it's going to lead firms to raise the sensitivity of pre-tax earnings to performance. Why is that? 
Well, if the firm wants to keep the level of effort constant um, and, the, and the government sort of in, improves social insurance, increases the progressivity of the tax code, it's going to lower everything I see, it's going to lower the incentives of the worker to provide effort, okay? Because it's going to reduce the spread of uh, her compensation. So if the firm wants to keep effort incentives the same, it's going to have to raise the pre-tax uh, the pre-tax earnings risk, so the sensitivity of earnings to performance. Okay, so that's a direct crowd out effect, uh, which is that in response to progressivity sensitivity of, of uh, wages of earnings goes up. But then there is a second effect, which is that remember, the sensitivity of earnings depends directly on effort because of the more hazard problem. But effort in turn is directly decreasing in taxes. And that's a completely standard labor supply disincentive effects of taxation. Okay, so if taxes increase, effort will go down, optimal level of effort will go down. But how, again, how in, with a more hazard friction, how does the firm um, elicit a lower level of effort from the worker? It does so by providing her with more insurance, okay? Or by reducing the sensitivity of uh, uh, earnings to output, okay? So here, those two effects exactly cancel out. You see that if you replace effort in the expression for the sensitivity um, with its value as a function of taxes, taxes completely disappear from the expression for the sensitivity uh, of the contract to output. So the sensitivity of earnings to output, the, the, the earnings contract is completely invariant to the tax rate in this very, very simple framework. Okay, so what I want you to remember from this, from this, uh, from this simple framework is the two, you know, direct crediting at effect and indirect performance pay effect through labor supply decision. Um, so these models, you know, is extremely simple. It has a lot of limitations, which I'm going to list here, or I'm going to list some of them here. The, uh, the most obvious one is that it relies on a lot of functional form assumptions. Uh, exponential utility, you know, that's the setting of Holmstrom and Milgram. Uh, no income effects. The performance shocks were Gaussian. There was no excente heterogeneity, even though I've talked about it in the, in the introduction. And, and something which um, I find particularly important, which is that we assume the quadratic disutility of effort. So you may think you know, uh, that, that this plays a huge role in our results because uh, I've, I've told you that the counteracting effect, the effect that countervails the, the crowd out is going through labor efforts decisions. But here we've assumed a very specific form of uh, a very specific value for the elasticity of labor effort. So we want to relax that assumption. And that's what I'm going to do next. The second key uh, restriction of this super simple framework was that we worked with an affine tax schedule. And the reason we worked with an affine tax schedule as opposed to allowing for arbitrary taxes is because uh, to apply the Holmstrom and Milgram results, we have to assume an exponential utility function. But nonlinear taxes, what they do effectively, they modify the utility, the realized utility that workers get from a given compensation given by the firm. Okay, so it modifies the link between a given pre-tax earnings to consumption. So if we assume an arbitrarily uh, nonlinear tax, tax schedule, it's gonna make the effective utility from the wage payments by the firm uh, move away from this exponential class. Okay, so, so, so to keep uh, the sort of the exponential utility over pre-tax wages, we, we had to assume uh, affine taxes. So in the paper, we relax all of these assumptions. And the way we do it is by using for the, the model of contracts between the firm and the worker, the model of Edmonds and Gabex for the static version of our model and Edmonds, Gabex, Sadzik and Sanikov for the dynamic version of our model. These models, uh, we use them for two reasons. The first reason is that they've been you know, pretty successful at explaining the empirical features of at least executive pay. So one form of, um, of uh, performance pay contracts. And the second, which is more technical, the second reason we use their framework is that they uh, remain tractable as opposed to the Holmstrom Milgram model. They remain tractable, these frameworks, for general uh, utility functions. Um, and no, we, don't, we no longer have to assume exponential uh, functional forms, uh, et cetera. So uh, again, by the same reasoning as above, uh, as I described above, you know, like allowing for general utility functions allows us to uh, consider arbitrarily nonlinear taxes 
because we don't have to 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 remain within a class of uh, utility functions. And so, how do Edmonds and Gabex, uh, or Edmonds, Gabex, Sadik, and Sanikov, how do they manage to have tractability um, for arbitrary utility functions, which for us is so important? Well, they do so by uh, making a timing assumption, um, which is that the performance shock of the worker, eta, is realized before the agent chooses her optimal effort level A. Okay, so I'm not gonna spend time uh, uh, discussing that in detail. We can discuss that uh, after the, the talk. Um, but, um, but making this assumption turns out to simplify the problem substantially and allow us to get a close form solution essentially for the optimal contract between the firm and the worker. Now, uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm not gonna go through this full blown version of the model. I'm gonna show you something intermediate between what I've shown you before and, and that full model. So I'm still gonna make a bunch of functional form assumptions, but I'm gonna relax sort of uh, two things. The first, uh, which is sort of the most important, I'm gonna relax the assumption that the labor supply elasticity was you know, peculiar with this quadratic utility of effort. So I'm gonna allow for an arbitrary disutility of effort. And so I'm gonna try to convince you that this, um, um, that this uh, performance pay channel that offsets the, the um, direct crowd out of private insurance is robust to various values of the elasticity of labor supply. So that's the first thing that I'm going to relax in this talk. And the second thing is I'm going to look at uh, uh, a shape, a nonlinear shape for the tax schedule. I'm going to move away from a fine taxes and I'm going to look at nonlinear taxes. Uh, they are still going to be restricted within a functional form, but they are going to be nonlinear. Okay, um, so more general version of, of the model. So agents now are indexed by their exogenous innate ability. Remember their um, raw ability, their education that's not insurable by the firm. Um, I'm gonna make again, because it's not the full general version, I'm gonna make again a bunch of um, functional form assumptions. I'm gonna assume that the utility is separable and is logarithmic in consumption, but I'm gonna allow for sort of um, more general disutility of labor. And in particular, I'm gonna allow for an arbitrary free elasticity uh, of labor supply, okay? Taxes, I'm gonna assume that uh, there is a constant rate of progressivity. So we call that CRP. Um, for the macroeconomists in the room, you know, this is a tax code that has been popularized um, recently by heat code stores, Letton and Violante, uh, but that was there for a while. I, uh, I found a paper by uh, Musgrave and Thin in the 1940s that already introduces uh, this tax system. So it's a tax code where after tax earnings um, are an isoelastic uh, uh, function of pre-tax earnings W. So P here uh, denotes the rate of progressivity of the tax code. Okay, so as in the simpler version of the model, a worker with ability theta now, prov now produces output A plus eta, where A is her effort and eta is her performance shock. And it's gonna be multiplied by theta, which is the innate, you know, the ability of the agent, the exogenous ability of the agent. Again, I'm gonna assume that the performance shock is, is normally distributed. Um, and I'm gonna assume that the firm observes the agent's exogenous ability theta, uh, but it doesn't, it, it's, again, as, in, as before, it cannot disentangle between effort A and performance shock eta, okay? So it's gonna design a contract that specify a level of effort A of theta uh, for different, uh, for workers of different abilities and uh, an earning schedule W, which again will, de will depend, will be direct, will be an explicit function of the performance of the output of the agent. Um, it's gonna do so uh, to maximize profit subject to incentive compatibility constraints and participation constraints. It's gonna have to deliver a reservation value U of theta for the workers of ability theta, which is, which is gonna be determined by free entry. Okay, so um, again, in this, in this framework, we can have a closed form for the, for the actual wage contract, uh, the earnings contract. So the earnings of an agent with um, ability theta and performance 
shock eta is going to be log linear in the performance of the agent. So that means that the schedule of earnings is going to be a convex function of performance. Okay. On average, you can uh, sort of trivially show that on average, earnings of the worker are equal to her ability times her effort. If you were in a Merlis model, that's exactly that, that's all you would have, right? Earnings would simply be equal to ability times effort. So here, around this average level of earnings, you have dispersion. And dispersion is given by, is, can, all, can still be parameterized by a one parameter uh, psi, the sensitivity now of log earnings to performance. Okay. Uh, and psi is again increasing in the marginal, in, the, in effort, because the disutility of effort is convex. So the, the sensitivity of uh, earnings to outputs is an increasing function of effort, just like before. It's a more hazard problem. And again, it's decreasing in taxes. Okay. Um, we can then say, well, look, just like we did before, what is the impact of raising tax progressivity P on uh, the wage contract, on the earnings contract? We can just take the derivatives of these earning contracts with respect to P. What do we get? Um, we get that the change in earnings or the elasticity of earnings with respect to the rate of progressivity of the tax code is the sum of three terms. Okay, the first term is a term that you would have in a standard Merlis model. It's saying, well, if on average earnings are proportional to efforts, there is a standard labor supply channel that if progressivity goes up, effort goes down. Uh, by this elasticity, every time I use the letter epsilon, it's to denote an elasticity. So that's the elasticity of effort with respect to the rate of progressivity. So effort goes down, and as a result, um, the earnings of the worker go down as well. Okay, that's sort of a standard labor supply channel that's already present in the Merlis model. But now, because of the endogeneity of the pass through, see, the endogeneity of the sensitivity of earnings to performance we have additional effects of, um, of progressivity on earnings. So as before, as in the Holmstrom Milgram uh, benchmark, you have two, uh, two effects. First, progressivity directly affects uh, the sensitivity of earnings, directly affects earnings risk. And that's the crowding out effect. And it's basically, I mean, uh, a bit superficially speaking, it's a one for one crowding out. Okay, so the elasticity of the pass through of uh, performance to log earnings uh, with respect to progressivity is equal to minus one. So it's a one for one crowding out. And again, the intuition for this crowding out effect is that if the government raises tax progressivity, if the firm wants to keep the effort incentives the same, it's going to counteract that, that better social insurance, but by worse private insurance, it's going to spread out the pre-tax earnings distribution so that on net the worker after this pre-tax spread and this uh, compression of the tax system is going to be exactly as before it's going to have the same effort incentives as before okay so that crowding out in response to higher progressivity is going to create a steeper pre-tax earning schedule but then there's going to be an indirect uh, performance pay effect and that performance pay effect is going to go through labor effort decisions Okay, so it says that in response to higher progressivity, um, the optimal level of effort is going to be smaller, standard disincentive effects of taxation. But this smaller level of effort, in turn, is going to be implemented, is going to be elicited by raising uh, private insurance. Okay, it's going to be elicited by reducing the sensitivity of earnings to output. Um, so this indirect performance pay effect sort of counteracts the direct crowd out. It implies a flatter earning schedule, a flatter pre-tax earning schedule in response to uh, higher progressivity. So what we can show in this model, again, in this sort of uh, simple model, what we can show is that overall the crowd out, the direct effect dominates, strictly dominates the performance pay effect. So on net, private insurance is going to be worse when tax progressivity uh, gets better. Okay. However, 
what I'm going to try to convince you of is that um, the strength of these two forces are roughly of the same magnitude. Okay, so that on net the contract barely changes. So why is that? Well, the key the key insight is that the elasticity of the pass through with respect to effort. So that's the more hazard effect when you when you want to elicit higher effort by how much do you increase the sensitivity of earnings? That's basically given by the inverse of the free elasticity of labor supply. Okay, and that's a result that's general. That's not specific to this simple model. It's simply by looking at the expression for the pass through, which was uh, directly proportional to the marginal disutility of labor. Okay, so almost uh, trivially, you get that the elasticity of the pass through with respect to effort is given by the inverse of the free elasticity. Okay, and again, that's more general than this specific model. But now, if you look at the at what the performance pay effect is equal to, remember it's equal to the elasticity of labor supply. How does effort change? Multiplied by how does this change in effort um, affect the pass through, the sensitivity of earnings? But if the sensitivity, the elasticity of the sensitivity of earnings is one over the elasticity of effort, when you multiply it by the change in effort, you get something. You get one, which is the size of the crowd out. Right, you get one over the elasticity of effort times the elasticity of effort, which is one, which is what the one for one crowd out was. Okay, so so that's that's true only if you know the elasticity of effort with respect to tax progressivity is equal to the frisch, right? Because then you have one over the frisch times the frisch, which is exactly one, which is exactly the crowd out. Um, in, 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 in theory, you know, the elasticity of effort with respect to progressivity may be different from the Frisch, but uh, to the extent that it's not too far from the Frisch elasticity of labor supply, you should expect that the, performance, the countervailing performance pay effect has roughly the same magnitude as the direct crowd out effect. Okay, wh what's the intuition for this and why does it not depend on the elasticity of labor supply? I imagine that the elasticity of labor supply with respect to taxes is very small. Okay, imagine that you have a, a almost inelastic labor effort. Well, what, uh, you know, what happens then is that in response to a change in tax progressivity, effort will barely move. But precisely because effort is inelastic, this, this tiny movement in effort will require a huge change in sensitivity of earnings. To induce the, the worker to change effort by this tiny amount is going to require a huge increase in the exposure to risk. Uh, so, so, the, so the two effects are exactly of the inverse magnitude for, uh, from each other. Right? And so on that, so this result is, is sort of um, um, unaffected, is robust to the value of the labor supply elasticity. So it's a result that's going through effort, a countervailing force to the crowd out that's going through labor supply decisions, but we which we expect to be robust to the value of the labor supply elasticity. Okay. So again, that seems to be consistent with empirical findings we found, although um, uh, you know, we, we believe more, more empirical work should be done on this. Um, there seems to be empirically little evidence that um, the performance pay contracts are, um, you know, react strongly to tax policy, despite the fact that we, we should expect a large crowd out. Um, we then, you know, sort of calibrate a slightly uh, more, um, a slightly fancier version of this model where we allow for both um, performance pay jobs and normal jobs, meaning jobs without uh, endogenous wage risk. Um, and we, you know, we calibrate this model by matching uh, both distribution, the distribution of earnings within performance pay jobs and within um, normal jobs. Okay, both their mean and their variance. So we choose the parameter of, the, of our models for that. We calibrate the tax system as in, as in uh, Heathcote et al. And we observe graphically what I sort of showed you theoretically, which is that if we take an original wage profile, okay, which uh, in our model is the optimal wage profile as a function of performance, is this blue curve here, which is this convex earning schedule. Um, this earning schedule has a sensitivity to performance, which is 0.73, or perhaps um, more easily understandable, you know, the variance of log earnings um, uh, is 0.22. Uh, 
if we only had a crowd out, if we only have the if we only had the crowd out effect in response to higher progressivity. So here, what we're going to do is a huge tax reform. We're going to double the rate of progressivity that we have in the U.S. So in the U.S., the rate the current rate of progressivity is roughly 0.18. Um, and we're going to double it. Why double? Because what we show is that in our model, the optimal rate of progressivity, I'll show you that in a minute, the optimal rate of progressivity is approximately double the rate that's currently uh, in the US. So it's like 0.35 or 0.36. Um, so we're going to move from the current US rate of progressivity to double that to get to the full optimum. Um, so currently, uh, our model predicts that the wage contracts uh, and our calibrated model will we, we, we'll have you know, a variance of log wages of 0.22. If in response to this doubling of the tax progressivity, we only had a crowd out, the sensitivity, the pre-tax sensitivity of earnings to output would massively increase to 0.93. Uh, the variance, otherwise, otherwise said, you know, the variance of log earnings would increase by 62%. So in response to this doubling of, of, of tax progressivity, the firm would uh, very strongly increase the variance of pre-tax earnings. It's a direct crowd out. But when we take into account this performance pay effect, we find that the, um, the sensitivity of earnings to output goes back to essentially where it was before. Right? So that's the orange line on the graph. Or otherwise said the variance of log earnings uh, increases compared to the initial situation by only 8%. So the crowd out dominates but roughly 90% of it is uh, counteracted by this you know, performance pay effect. Okay, so I have a few minutes left and I wanna talk about the aggregate analysis. So, so far, I have, so far what I've done is I've only looked at one contract, one worker essentially, and I've looked at how this contract is affected theoretically by tax progressivity. And now I wanna say, well, I have all these people in the economy who differ in their ex-ante ability theta, and I want to look at what are the optimal taxes. What is the optimal rate of progressivity in this economy? So I'm, I'm not going to have time to go into much detail, but I'm just going to first summarize um, the impact of tax progressivity on first social welfare and two on um, government revenue. Okay, and I'll show you the optimal tax formula uh, right after. So the welfare gains of redistribution, what we find the welfare gains of raising um, tax progressivity, we find that they are uh, smaller, strictly smaller than in the model with exogenous wage risk. Why is that? Again, it's the crowd out. Also, you may say, but the, you know, so essentially the crowd out, what it means is that if the government tries to raise tax progressivity, the firm will completely undo that by uh, raising pre-tax earning sensitivity so that the worker will be uh, completely indifferent. So that completely mutes one of the roles of the government in standard models, which is to provide insurance. Okay, so for a given amount of inequality you observe in the economy, the government now only can do redistribution and all of the insurance, um, you know, uh, over addiction of inequality um, via social insurance is completely muted. But you're gonna say, well, the crowd out effect isn't it counteracted by the performance pay effect. I spent the almost all of the talk talking about that. Well, no. Uh, because remember that the, the performance pay effect goes through earnings, sorry, goes through labor supply. So by the envelope theorem, that only has second order effects on welfare. So that will have an effect on government revenue on the excess burden of taxes, but on welfare, it basically doesn't matter. Okay, so that's the, fir the, the, the first effect is that because of the, of the crowd out, higher tax progressivity will um, uh, completely be undone by uh, pre-tax, um, uh, by, by crowding out of pre-tax insurance. There is a second effect that even further reduces the welfare gains of tax progressivity, which is that tax cuts in our model are not given directly to, worker, to workers anymore, right? It's the way, is the firms that provide workers with wages. And um, what we show is that a given tax cut is gonna be distributed among workers in a regressive fashion by the firms. I'm not going to enter the details here. I'm more than happy to talk about it after. Uh, but basically, a given $1 tax cut is not going to be distributed uh, evenly to all the workers of the firm. It's going to go for incentive reasons. It's going to go uh, primarily to the highest performers. So when the government tries to uh, reduce taxes or increase taxes, they are less targeted towards those the government wants to help if it has a concave social welfare portion. 
Okay, so we show that the, that the welfare gains over distributions for all these reasons are strictly smaller than in the standard model. On the excess burden side, so if we look at the impact of taxes on government revenue, uh, we have the standard dead weight loss from um, uh, distorting effort decisions. And we show that the crowding out effect and the performance pay effect generate fiscal externalities. Basically, if you have uh, a progressive tax code um, by Jensen's inequality, you're going to have higher tax revenue if the pre-tax earnings are more spread out for, for a given mean, if there is a if there is a higher volatility of earnings, if the pre-tax if the tax schedule is progressive, you're gonna that's gonna raise government revenue. Okay, it's a simple application of Jensen's inequality. So as a result, you know the crowd out and the performance pay, which sort of increase or decrease the volatility of earnings, um, are gonna generate this kind of fiscal externalities. We put all these effects together and we obtain the optimal tax formula, the formula for the optimal tax progressivity P star. In a standard uh, model with exogenous wage risk, you know, uh, the elasticity of effort with respect to taxes, so that's the crowd out effect, that would be minus one. Um, so that the government, um, sorry, that would be zero. The pass through would be independent of tax progressivity so that the government would both ensure um, Exente ability and exposed performance shocks. But in the model with endogenous wage risk, this crowd out elasticity is minus one, so that this insurance role of the government is completely muted. Okay, the government can only insure, uh, can only redistribute uh, over exente abilities, and uh, trying to help with exposed performance shocks is uh, at best useless. Okay. On the, on the cost side of the cost of raising progressivity, we have the standard labor supply channel and we have um, an additional fiscal externality of the kind that I discussed in the previous slide. Um, erase that. Um, if we put all of this together, you have strictly lower optimal rate of progressivity than in a model with, end, with exogenous wage risk. However, quantitatively, uh, the optimal rate of progressivity, so um, the, the losses from uh, implementing a suboptimal rate of progressivity, so the losses uh, from ignoring you know, these red terms here, coming from the endogeneity of the private wage contract, um, are very small, about a quarter of a percent of consumption. Okay, so uh, let me just show you that in the graph. Um, the black dot here is, uh, I, I just made it red, so sorry about that. The black dot here is basically the US tax progressivity, but 0.18. The full optimum, the fully optimal rate of progressivity in our model would be the, the green dot here, 0.35. And if we uh, looked at a government that would ignore that would ignore the endogeneity of private insurance, it would set a higher, strictly higher rate of progressivity, which is the red dot on the graph, so 0.4. So it's a substantial difference in the actual uh, tax code between 0.35 and 0.4. But the losses, because, so, so the losses are, are actually very small. The losses from suboptimizing, from choosing the red dot as opposed to the green dot, are actually very small for two reasons. Why? One, because uh, there's only half of the jobs in the US so uh, that are performance pay jobs. So that's, you know, divide by, divides by two um, uh, the welfare losses from, uh, from suboptimizing. But not only that, but moreover, um, this, you know, this reduction by half of the type of jobs uh, that, are, that have endogenous wages, um, that actually implies a reduction by a quarter of the welfare loss. Um, because uh, the social welfare function is concave. So the social welfare is, is locally concave, okay? Um, around the optimum. So it's social is locally flat around the optimum. Okay, so uh, quantitatively, the losses from choosing a suboptimal optimal rate of progressivity uh, are very small. So I'm gonna conclude here. Uh, we look at a more general uh, model in the paper where we relax the assumptions on the utility function that I've made here. You know, I've assumed log utility and so on. We relax the assumption on the distribution of performance shocks, eta, you know, it's, um, it's not necessarily Gaussian. Um, 
the linear the tax code can be arbitrarily nonlinear. The initial tax code and the tax reforms can be arbitrarily nonlinear. Um, I'm going to stop here. I'm more than happy to answer any question you may have. And thanks again for uh, attending the talk. OK, thanks so much, Nicholas. That was wonderful. So as usual, everyone, um, if you have questions, please use the raise your hand uh, option. And then we'll unmute you and you can ask your questions. Um, I guess what I, maybe you could say a little bit more about because you 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 mentioned that you would go back to it, but this, this, this neat trick where you, we just make this assumption that the ADA is observed yeah. um, before Absolutely. the action is taken. First of all, why can't the firm then back out the difference if they then know like A, it's, a is a function of ADA, right? So then couldn't they? So it's, it's, a, great, uh, it's a great question. So um, let me be super clear on this. Um, so Edmonds and Gabex make two assumptions, not one, but two assumptions. The first is the one that you mentioned first, which is that the agent chooses her efforts after observing her realization of the performance. Um, mm -hmm. The second assumption they make uh, is that the contract is uh, quote unquote reliable. It's a, it's a term that uh, uh, Carol and Meng use in oh. one of their paper, which is that the recommended effort level is constant independent of eta. So not only the, the workers mm -hmm. observe their level of performance before choosing their efforts, but the firm is going to induce the same amount of effort for every worker. And what that does is, uh, I guess, uh, for, formally, if, if I can show it to you formally, maybe it's going to be clear. So it's all in the incentive constraints. The firm is going to try to induce a level of effort that's going to be the same for every value of eta. And this level of effort is going to have to maximize the worker's utility ex post. So you know, if eta was observed um, uh, only after choosing effort, you would have an expectation in front of this. So the, the mm -hmm. optimal level of effort would maximize expected utility. So here, they impose, Edmonds and Gabex impose that you know, effort maximizes ex post utility for every level of performance shock, so for every eta. Uh, but moreover, uh, they restrict the contract in the, in the same way that we could restrict the contract by assuming it uh, to be linear or this kind of stuff. So they make this exogenous restriction on the contract, which is that effort, um, the effort that the firm wants to induce is the same for every worker. So in the paper, we, we use that as our baseline model. Uh, we also uh, extend it to the case where, to the more general case where the optimal level of effort uh, depends both on theta and on eta. Uh, to be uh, perhaps more consistent with the, with the timing assumption. Um, essentially, what we find is that the main, uh, the main insights uh, um, you know, are still valid in the sense that we still have both you know, a direct crowding out and an indirect um, performance pay effect that sort of offsets it. Uh, we cannot say you know, whether the, effect, the offset is, uh, is full or not. It would, uh, they are basically uh, technical complications in handling this, uh, this uh, more general function of efforts. But at least, you know, at a qualitative level, you still have these sort of two opposite effects at play. Oop. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so I think first we'll have then a question from Ralph. Ralph, okay. are you there? Yeah, yeah I'm here. Okay. Thanks, uh, great talk. So I was uh, a more empirical question also, but you know, you said you're working on this in the future, I guess. Uh, so how did this performance pay the fraction of people who have this change over time? And is there some correlation with the progressivity of the tax system? So when progressivity was, you know, was high, was it because, you know, it was optimal back then and, uh, you know, there was low performance pay. And then there was this other nice thing that you have if you change, you know, $1 of taxation, then it mo is mostly going through uh, high income households uh, through this performance pay. So do you have like any empirical evidence on this? OK, so these are two great questions. Uh, do, you see, do you see the slides that show April 2020 here? Yes. Yeah, OK. Yep. Um, for the, I, I had this picture. So for the first question you ask, um, let me show you. So this is, um, this is a picture from, um, from an empirical paper by Lomio, MacLeod, and Parent, uh, where they uh, try to, to look at the, at the fraction of performance pay jobs in the US. 
uh, over time. So, so I, I believe your, your first question was how did it evolve over time, the fraction of performance pay jobs? Um, and it's been roughly constant, at least since the 1975. So I'm, I'm not, um, you know, we, we didn't look yet at the empirics, uh, but at least according to this paper, you know, the, perf the, the, the share of performance pay, pay jobs is, is high and, uh, and, related and roughly constant. Um, the second question is, you know, how, is it related to progressivity? That's uh, to the progressivity of the tax code. That's a, that's a super great question. Um, well, so first, you know, it, it's, it doesn't look like um, it's the case, at least in this sample. You know, it's going from 75 to 98, where obviously the progressivity has changed a lot. However, if you look at uh, cross-country comparisons, you may have something there. Um, uh, it's a paper by von Rinnen and, and co-authors that, that looks at um, uh, some Swedish data and some US data. So they, I mean, it's, uh, you know, uh, two data points, uh, but, uh, but basically they show that in the US, there is a much higher fraction of performance pay jobs than, um, than in, uh, in Sweden, whether it's uh, due to progressivity, you know, uh, that's what I'm sure. So that would require modeling the extensive margin of uh, performance pay job creation. So here we model, you know, given a performance pay job, how does the, the sensitivity of, of, of pay to performance vary with progressivity? And we find not much. Uh, so the second question would be, you know, uh, how does the fraction, so how does the incentive of the firms to create this kind of performance pay jobs rather than normal jobs, um, how would that vary with progressivity? So that's something we're planning to do, but we haven't, uh, we haven't done it yet. Um, and your last question was, uh, was about this insight that, that I very briefly, very briefly mentioned on, um, on the fact that when the tax cut is mediated via the firm, um, it's actually given to highest performers. So, so this is a theoretical result we have in this model. I'm not aware of any empirical study that, uh, that looked at that. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, Abdul or Pavel, you have insights there. I'm not aware of, um, of any empirical study that looks at this. I mean, the, the, the reason, if I, if I can get a, a tiny bit technical and explain the, the reason in, um, in a slide, essentially, if you look at the fully general model with arbitrary utility function, you get that it looks very much like the log linear model I've shown you before. Basically, without entering the, the technical details, it looks like the utility uh, of workers is a linear function of their performance, eta, where again, the sensitivity is still given by this marginal utility of labor. And the um, demogrant is given by the reservation value of the workers. Okay, so I, it's, it's a bit uh, fast right now, but basically what that means is that if the reservation value of the worker goes up, it's going to be distributed uniformly among all the workers um, with that contract. But that means that the highest performers who have a really low marginal, marginal utility, those high performers will get a, a, a very large fraction of the tax cuts so that their utility increases by the same amount as the low performers who have high marginal utility. And, and, and just one, uh, the reason why, you know, like this tax cut, this um, raising utility should be distributed equally among all the workers, low performers and high performers, is sort of an artifact of the separability of the utility function. You know, if uh, the utility function is separable, incentive compatibility tells you that you should raise everyone's utility by the same amount. It's a standard, uh, standard result. So, so at this stage, it's a purely theoretical result. I'd be super happy to find any empirical evidence on this, but I don't have any at this moment. Great. Um, so I think Pat Keo has a question. Pat, I'm gonna uh, allow you to talk and then you have to unmute yourself. Hey, how is it going? That was a great talk. Can you just send me an email when you get a chance as what is the state of the art of the dynamic versions of anything like that? You had some references in the beginning back yeah. to... Uh, yeah, so I, uh, so, so I did not talk about it at all. Um, in the so the, the the static version is the Edmonds and Gabex paper that they extended their paper with along with uh, Sadzik and Sanikov to a dynamic version of the model, um, where you know efforts and wages are allowed to vary over time. Uh, we still assume that you know the extensibility is constant for the workers, uh, but you can have performance shocks that vary over time stochastically. And did they add those extra assumptions on the contract space yes, that you mentioned? Um, in fact, the timing assumption 
uh, sort of becomes natural when you move to a, to a continuous time setting where I see. Uh, yeah so, so, so I, we'll send you an email with a description of this. Um, so what we do here in the paper with the Sedmans, Gabek, Sadzik, and Sanikov, we look at the simpler version of the model that I've shown you in this talk, which with you know log utility and so on. So we make those spe specific functional form assumptions. Uh, we don't look at the fully general uh, version of the model with arbitrary nonlinear taxes and so on. But yes, I, I will send you an email with with uh, clear explanations on. Thank you very much. I got to run and say hi to Eugenia, uh, who's a new assistant. If you I will. if you're there, I will talk to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Any other questions? I'm muted. Okay, so Ralph, if you had a question, uh, not Ralph, sorry, Morton. Um, yeah, I, I, maybe it's a version of uh, Ralph's question actually. But I was thinking, if there were, um, if there were both uh, supplies of uh, jobs with and without um, performance pay, then I guess tax reform here would shift um, workers towards um, jobs uh, without performance pay. Would that? That might undo this um, the impact on the contract, I guess. Yeah, so that's something we are we are trying to look at. So here, um, again, we don't look at all at the extensive margin of. Um, um, I mean, I guess it's not. Yeah, I mean, it's. At the it doesn't need to be there. Yeah, I guess. Well, but at least at an endogenous fraction. So here, you know, even in the quantitative <laughs> analysis, we have an exogenous fraction of the of the two kinds of jobs. And if you are in a performance pay job, you you're 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 stuck there. Um, uh, that is something we want to look at next. Um, so, so I, I don't have a I don't have a super good answer for you right now. Uh, but as soon as we have, we'll uh, we'll send you an email with details on this. I mean, yeah, like you said, what we expect is that you know if progressivity goes up, presumably uh, it becomes less uh, less uh, beneficial to work in a performance paid job. So there's going to be some movements towards uh, normal jobs. Um, if yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to make any statement about uh, whether our results would be reinforced or counteracted. Okay. Okay. So, uh, if anyone else has any other questions, now's the time to raise your hand. Otherwise, we can um, move to the informal chat room. Um, okay. Great. So, thank you. Both, thank you guys very much for the the seminar. The talk it was excellent and. Again, I posted in the chat the link. So before I close this, copy the link um, and join us there. Thank okay. you so much, uh, Kurt, Laura, yes. Ralph, and Ralph, you everyone. In a, bit, in a second. <laughs> Bye. Yeah, no, thanks for a great talk. Um, everyone who wants to join, feel free to jump over to that. I will keep this meeting open for a couple more minutes just to give you a chance because once I close the meeting, the link disappears. Um, so I will stop the live stream, but anyway, thanks again. And